If, you, if you're going to push the snow level, this is Mount Shasta, you're going to push it up, as you go up, it's a declining amount of surface area. The higher you go up on a cone, and ultimately winter's getting shorter, precipitation may change a bit here and there. It doesn't look like a lot. It's just that more of it will come as a liquid and less will be a solid. And if you're dependent on one of the great designs, every western city in America is dependent on a big, tall freezer next to it. Think about it. Tell me about Salt Lake. Tell me about Portland. Tell me about Seattle. Tell me about Boise, right? Denver. They're all based on this. And as those go away, and you don't have this leaky, leaky from the top late into the year, it's going to be fascinating. So the water supply question is going to come in. And for those of you who happen to live in a place that's attached to the big pipe that gets filled via this, you're not immune even though you're coastal. And then you get into sea level rise, and I don't have a map for this because I don't, not from down here. But so here's San Francisco Bay, all right, and the dark blue is the current shoreline, and the light blue is the level of sea level intrusion, right, with one meter sea level rise. We're up eight inches in the last hundred years already, so give me another 32 inches. And every time they, the scientists visit Greenland and Antarctica, they go, oh my God, it's melting a little faster than we thought, right? A friend of mine just flew over Greenland the other day, and all he said he saw was lakes in Greenland. Now, see, Greenland's an interesting thing, because if the North Pole, they're talking about it'll be ice-free by mid-century in the summer, right? But that ice cube's already floating in the glass. Sea level's related, but not as dramatically. Greenland isn't an ice cube in the glass, right? It's up on land. And all of Greenland melts raises sea level how much? Anybody? It's like 20 feet, right? Is it predicted to melt? I mean, it's, it'll be a long, we, we hope it's a long time for all of Greenland to go, but all you need is 32 inches. And the entire Bay Delta of California, Sacramento, San Joaquin, Sacramento's now waterfront. The water for 25 million people in the state has to pass through that system. So it's an interesting time. And hopefully then I have depressed you enough that you're <laughs> basically thinking, all right, the, ti the Titanic is sinking. What's, what's sinking is our addiction to fossil fuels delivered to us by the oligarchy, right? And that whole peak oil question, which leads to peak water and thus peak food and peak population, is, is quite the quite the tag team coming. And in any case, when it's going down, you're looking for a lifeboat, right? For those of you who are looking to save yourself, the lifeboat is what you're looking for. And I would support you in recognizing that the lifeboat you want to find is what is called a watershed. It's going to be at watershed by watershed by watershed. Some of us will batten down the hatches, stem to stern, ridge line to river mouth, and get the system prepared, adaptive management, for the coming change and all the uncertainty. And we got to get water squared away and soil squared away and vegetation squared away and fire and fuel loads and transportation and, and energy and housing. And in a declining a time of energy availability, peak oil, and a population that's burgeoning. So it's watershed by watershed. And my main interest in coming down here and speaking about this stuff about you guys is to try to figure out how to support you and figuring out where your little watersheds are. And I, I've seen a beautiful map, I think it's at Arroyo Burro, that shows all the, like, 40 different little coastal watersheds along Santa Barbara coast, but I couldn't find it on the web. So you got to figure out, you got all these little mini steep-sided guys that pop along here and got a bunch of little bitty watersheds. And, and I'm just interested in that. All of you guys get your own lifeboat squared away so you don't come crawling in my lifeboat up in Sonoma County, Right? I'm interested in all of us rafting together our lifeboats in a regional resiliency, if we can. And it's going to be regional resiliency. It's not about stay out necessarily. I'm being a little facetious there. But I think the lifeboat is, is the, your living lifeboat is your watershed, is where it's at. And so the first place to start then is here, right? <clears throat> and the game for tonight is then I'm just trying to figure out how to support you all in mitigating a bit of your cerebral imperviousness, right? Here's the fractal that's got to get it, and it's an interesting time. It's a fun time to be around. <clears throat> now, 
This is a map that a, a guy I work with made of the lower Russian River. So here's Jenner, people know that, Bodega Bay is down here. This is, the, this is the Russian River that goes through Guerneville and on up. If people know 101 through Cotati, Rohnert Park, Santa Rosa, Windsor, Healdsburg. And so my lifeboat is this purple one called the Dutch Bill Creek Watershed. It's 11 square mile little system. We live up in the very tippy top. It goes through Occidental Camp, here to Monte Rio. But each of these colors you could look at is, is a community basin of relation. And all of the people who live within that basin have relations with each other. And it's as a community organizing principle based on the container, the geology and hydrology of a place. For those of us who do activism organizing, social organizing, I think these basins of relations present us a whole other way to think about community in a context that's actually meaningful. And if your lifeboat, like mine, Dutch Bill Creek, emptying into the Russian River with the first winter rainstorm, the first flush, if you're dumping that much mud into the creek, right, where I come from, Redwood country, we got some pretty good capacity to make soil naturally, right? And it takes us 700 years naturally to make an inch of topsoil. So if you're losing, besides the impact on salmon, if we're losing this much dirt, eh, it's going to be hard to figure out how to have sustainability in, your, in a, a number of sectors. And the stormwater world I'll talk more about is, is interesting. And you know these things that have become somewhat ubiquitous around construction sites are interesting. And thank goodness it was there. Look how high the water went up before it was going to go down the storm drain. But you, know, you get a sense that there's these legacy issues <clears throat> For some of us, my entire lifeboat was clear cut. There's not an old growth stick left in it by 1910. Right? I mean, we had, I have stumps 75 feet behind my house about that big. Kind of a big deal <laughs> with respect to water. And then the ongoing stuff, and, and you guys here in Santa Barbara have your own issues, right? You get a different form of clear cut every once in a while. <clears throat> we do as well up there, but I know it's with your chaparral communities here, it's really different. And, it's a fascinating thing. How, what, how do we manage sustainable fuel loads in a, in a lifeboat to mitigate catastrophic conversion of vegetation in a system like Chaparral that actually becomes old growth in a decade, right? 20 years, 30 years, it's decadent. So <clears throat> now I, down here, at least, you have remnant runs of steelhead, which are just ocean-going rainbow trout. Up where I come from in the Russian, we have Chinook salmon, king salmon, which is what these are. This is Humboldt County from the Eel River. Um, we also have coho salmon, we have steelhead. All three are listed. And interesting photo, it's like the classic phrase where I come from is that the fish were so thick you could walk on their backs. Or I guess you could walk on their sides when you hucked them out of the river and loaded them up. What you, I would support you in seeing in this here is that fish, from an ability to sustain nutrient cycles perspective, represents a 40-pound sack of 10-10-10 fertilizer with all the trace minerals. Fish emulsion. Spawn till you die, as far as you can go in the headwaters, and after you die, bears and eagles and otters and coons and skunks and possums and native people and insects, everybody's partying, everybody's eating fish, and everybody's walking up there and, right? You are what you don't shit. Think about it. <clears throat> but what you do... If you're eating fish, you're moving nutrients. And the lots of studies, there's something called the anadromous nutrient pump. Anadromy. Organisms that go freshwater, saltwater, freshwater. Right? Salmonids, lampreys in our Pacific system. Scientists looked in these organ streams, sampling the needles in fir trees along the river, looking at the nitrogen in the fir tree in a, in a healthy salmon-based system. 60% of the nitrogen is of marine origin. Look at a juvenile steelhead in the stream. 60% of the nitrogen is of marine origin, isotopically. Take a grizzly bear bone that you take out of a museum that was shot in 1872 from Yellowstone when it was made a park, right? Yeah, where's Yellowstone? Oh, it's across the Columbia the state of Washington, across the snake, across Idaho, and hooking up into Wyoming, 1,500 miles. 50% of the calcium from that grizzly bear bone when sampled isotopically was of marine origin. These salmonids are the primary bearers, bearers or eaglers or otterers, the otter get this one, right, that 
they're bringing back the nutrients. 